So I'm very pleased to host another Innovation Cafe session with you guys. Uh, this, this community is becoming uh, popular. I think we are really helping each other to become better. We are, we are also helping our organizations to become better. Uh, and I, I think I've talked about this before. Uh, I really think the innovation world or the corporation in, in, or, the, or the corporate innovation world is somehow broken. So we need more than methods. We need more than uh, follow this, follow this playbook and you will succeed. This is why this uh, session today is so important because we are going to talk about AI uh, to improve the world of in, in innovation. So it, it's a pl really a pleasure to have you here today, uh, Jax Ludic or Dr. Jax Ludic. Uh, yeah. And I know that we have a few AI experts here in the room as well. So I think this is going to be a very exciting uh, session. So let's make it informal, peer to peer. Yeah. We are here to learn and share once again. Okay, so uh, over to you. We need again. Thank you so much for your time today. Fantastic. So you've started recording, so we can start straight away. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Hugo. I, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity just to speak and uh, explore, and uh, we can keep it super interactive. I do have some slides that I'm sharing here, but uh, I um, I'm, I'm very happy to address any specific questions um, that people have. Um, just in terms of time, so we've got about, what, 40 minutes um, and then questions or is it, got, is it an hour? We've got a full hour. That we can I, 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 I've, usually what we do is 15 to 20 minutes presentation and then Q&A, uh, one hour at most of the, the whole session. Okay, full set. fantastic, fantastic. Okay, so this is, a, um, I'm going to quickly start. I just want to highlight a few things just to set the scene um, in terms of I'm looking at the world and maybe I'll also give a little bit of background on myself in terms of uh, where I fit in and, and how I see things. Um, so this was a, a, a recent presentation that I did. Um, uh, even on the national level, we do have these discussions around um, AI. So this was an AI dialogue um, organized by uh, people that participating in the, um, the Fourth Industrial Revolution Commission. Um, and it was organized by some universities and it was initiatives, it was actually initiatives between um, um, academia as well as the uh, public sector and private sector kind of participation. And we were particularly talking about um, innovation and how to operationalize AI in a smart technology era. So I thought, given we want to talk about AI, we want to, um, and I thought this is maybe a good way to anchor um, today's discussion. And uh, so I'll, I'll just very quickly, just to quickly talk about uh, me specifically and how I think about it. <clears throat> I think as a, as a human race, as a homo sapiens, we live in a very interesting time um, where we can use technology for the better or for the worse. Um, and my massive transformative purpose and also the organizations, the companies that I'm involved in, um, as well as the Machine Intelligence Institute of Africa, which is a nonprofit organization, is, is really how to shape a better future in the smart technology era. And obviously, and technology alone can't do that. Uh, we, we obviously talk about society, social engineering, there's economics, we probably need to re-engineer capitalism or, or just the economy. Um, and, and there's a m bunch of other things that we need to think about. Um, we've seen many use cases of where technology has not been used optimally. So if you think about social media, for instance, we see the positive and negative effects. So what we need is, is really visionary leadership and wisdom to apply technology in the right way. Um, and so we've got to be innovative. So I think innovation is the buzzword here. So we're gonna, um, but we need innovation on multiple levels. It's multidimensional. Um, and what we are seeing also, um, and especially the last two decades, we've seen serious disruption of industries. Um, you know what happened to Kodak. Uh, you, you've seen the disruptions with many other companies the last two decades. And we see the biggest companies in the world, what they are doing, what the big tech players are doing. And they are leading the way with smart tech. They're leading the way with how data is being utilized and monetized in an optimal way. Um, and disruption is coming from all over the place, from all sorts of different angles. Um, so what I would love to see is that we do create a more equitable society, society where technology can help us, more people live better lives, higher quality lives. Um, so that's, I just wanted to frame it there. 
in, in that respect. So when I talk about a better future in the smart technology era, I'm talking about society as well as business uh, in general. Um, so I'm not going to, I think people uh, to know about the fourth industrial revolution. I just want to say that uh, I've got a, another name for it. I call it the smart technology era. I'm also writing a book right now on, um, uh, on, on transformative human centric artificial intelligence. Um, and, and, and I'm talking about shaping their future in the smart technology era, uh, which is pretty much the fourth industrial revolution, but it, there's some interesting perspectives on that. And then there's a bunch of technologies that's actually at the, at the core of this new inno the innovation that we see. And, and specifically, if you look at the definition around the smart technology era, we're seeing a fusion of new technologies that's blurring the lines between the physical, the digital, and the biological worlds. Um, and, and if we think about the speed of technology change, that's, that's something else. As humans, we are very used to just experience time as something linear, which it is, but we do see all these kind of changes that's happening. And some of, some of those changes are actually on exponential rates. So you see a bunch of exponential curves here. And what you see here is some exponential technologies um, of which artificial intelligence is obviously one of the key, probably the key exponential technology. But what we see is it is used in combination with lots of other technologies, augmented reality, virtual reality. You see self-driving cars. Um, we see so many other things happening here. And I've, got, I've just listed biotech, nanotech, neurotech. Um, we know about brain computer interfaces, um, 3D printing, printing, robotics, drones, all of these type of things come into play. And with that, basically what's happened here, we've, we've got incredible rich smart technology toolbox. And what we need is obviously um, uh, people that's, that's knowledgeable enough about how to use these technologies to put it together with all these legal blocks and to create solutions and solve problems using the technology. So we've got an unbelievable uh, canvas to play with effectively. Uh, with this. So, so, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Can, can you make it full screen, please? Uh, oh, yes, I can. Sorry. So maybe <laughs> I can, sure. uh, Thank you very much. Yeah. Sorry, it's a bit small, that one. Yes. Okay, let me go. Okay, let's see. Is that better? Can, can you see? Maybe I can just reduce that. Now you can see everything. Can, can you see the screen? Yes, you changed slide, but we can see the whole, the whole screen now. So it's great. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Um, I, we'll move to, I'll get off the screen, then we can do a face to face again. So I just want to go through a few things here. Um, so this is an interesting slide. There's actually a slide I don't, um, of, um, I think it's in SoftBank's, um, it comes originally from SoftBank. And the way they were looking, they're looking at the world is if you think about the last, well, in terms of business value being unlocked, but basically what you see is um, that Obviously, agriculture, fishery, metals originally was the, the main industry for unlocking business value. And, and you can see after that industrial and financial space, and obviously all of the industry is still participating, but you can see here from the 1995, the internet era, uh, with the Googles and the Facebooks and even the Amazons and so forth. And basically where we sit right now, because of the world being instrumented at scale, um, basically, what we see is um, that we've entered a new age and we, we can talk, I talk about the smart technology era, the way um, these guys see, see this is the AI era, um, because AI is, is, is probably the exponential technology and because we, we are instrumenting the world, we're generating data at an exponential rate, data utilization is still linear, so that gap is increasing all the time, um, but the value now is you can unlock it with AI driven uh, technologies. So this, this is what this is about. Um, okay, so now I need to see if I can move to the next screen. Let's see. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to go too much. This is more um, specifically around what we are doing a little bit of my history. And maybe the only thing I want to say here, um, I've built my whole career on artificial intelligence, did my PhD in machine learning AI. I think it was probably one of the first guys here in Africa doing it during the winter period. And then I founded my first AI company, Seasync Systems, um, 
which was the first AI company on the African continent that was eventually sold to General Electric. Uh, and that was in 2011. Um, and then I was involved in a few other um, companies. Um, I was always looking at my next move, uh, which was Cortex Logic as the next generation AI company. And then also I wanted to plow back and I uh, founded the Machine Intelligence Institute of Africa to build an AI community, African AI community. We don't want Africa to be left behind. I think it's important for the world that all the continents are strong and, and in, in AI and smart technology. And uh, the rest, I'm not gonna go too much detail there. So let's, uh, just wanted to briefly mention that. So when we talk about innovation from a business perspective, I, it always starts with the business value drivers. So the business value drivers to thrive in the smart technology area, you think about that, it still goes back to what makes a business tick, what makes a business work. Um, so for me, there's, there's really two big areas. There's the industrial world, and then if you think about the retail, finances, um, you can look at all the other industries that's more consumer facing. So for consumer facing businesses, it's really, all about real-time, on-demand, digital, personalized service delivery at scale. And for that, you need a 360-degree view of, 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 of the customer so that you can actually provide that services. And we see this already with YouTube and, and, and Uber, Airbnb, and Facebook, and all these kind of companies, uh, Netflix, um, Amazon with recommendation engines, and so forth. What can be done with data? at scale. So there's obviously lots of um, advantages in terms of enhancing efficiencies, reducing processing times, also to do targeted sales and marketing, to have a much better grip on my audience and what they want and what their needs are. And I think intelligent virtual assistants um, are proper ones that's really anchored, properly integrated, um, ones that truly understand meaning and, and so forth. Those are incredible opportunities to enhance customer experience and, and do the target sales and marketing. On the industrial world, it's really about increasing throughput, increasing yield, increasing quality, reducing waste, um, making sure that equipment is not failing, all of those type of things. You want to optimize processes. And if you improve the throughput yield quality with one or two or three percent, that translates to millions of dollars straight away. So there's huge opportunities there. So obviously for the consumer facing side, things like cross-selling, upselling, recommendations, um, anything like fraud, waste and abuse, you wanna reduce that. Um, there's obviously cybersecurity risks. So in all of these areas, there's gonna be innovation needed. And AI is a catalyst to help with that innovation around that. And on the left-hand side, I'm showing um, just um, the key business value drivers, productivity for revenue increase, reducing risk and for lowering costs. Um, so AI driven businesses can, can really leapfrog and can do special things. But then in the middle, I have this creating strategic value bucket. And the innovation is not just on solving business problems and making your operations more efficient, more effective, increasing revenues, or just having this enhanced customer experience and so forth. But there is um, obviously also the opportunity to, to have faster, better, more proactive decisions. So you do an acceleration of that effectively. And then if you think about the business models, with data, you can create new business models. You can create new revenue growth opportunities. Um, and, and there's incredible opportunities around that. So there's innovation around that. You can also think about how you want to partner with other businesses that's maybe adjacent and create and disrupt industries by combining data sources, by combining business models. So for me, the, the innovation is on multiple levels. We're not only talking about individually on a business, it is, it is the way you innovate, it's the way it could actually change the nature of the business. Um, you might think you're in this business and then you trans transition into something different over time. So, because you obviously see how the, the, the market is evolving. So, so I think it's very important to think carefully about these kind of things and to connect the dots uh, around these, these kind of things. So I think 
that that is that is important. Um, so I, I think for any business, there's also the opportunity not to only you can optimize the business. The more you instrument the business, similar to if you think about an industrial plant, you've got typically sensors all over the place. So you, you understand what's going on in the process, what's going on around this piece of equipment. If you think about an aircraft, a jet engine, um, there's typically 2,000 to 3,000 sensors around that engine that gives information in real time what's happening. Um, and they talk about digital twins, creating digital twins of all sorts of pieces of equipment. Could be turbines, could be MRI scanners, could be all sorts of expensive equipment, but you can instrument anything these days with IoT, AI and IoT. But what's also happened here, because as, as humans, we, with social media and with cell phones and smartphones and smart devices, and I've got a smart watch, we are instrumenting ourselves. So we're now generating data at scale ourselves um, as well. So that also provides opportunities to, um, for businesses to, um, to, to provide more better services and all of those kind of things, as I've mentioned. But I also want to mention, when you think about business, and once you can create models of a business, but you can also create models of a, supply, a business with its supply chain. And then you can start doing optimization around that. But in order to do that, you need to instrument that whole supply chain. Um, and, and, and I think we see the same kind of thing um, obviously, with um, with I, well, IoT, uh, AI and IoT is, is also a incredibly important way to help instrument um, businesses and its supply chains. Um, okay, so and then obviously your employees as well. Um, we are involved with um, solutions where we talk about employee wellness. Um, I think there's, there's about 3.2 billion workers in, in the workforce worldwide. And what's really happening is a disturbing thing where the, the workforce are really getting unwell. Um, and it costs, I think in the US, they've calculated $2.2 trillion loss um, um, every year, annually. Um, so almost like 12% of the GDP of, of the US. Um, so just to give you, show you the, the, the real issues there. So we need innovation around um, how we work with the employees as well. We've got to be innovative there. And then uh, the, the next bucket here is smart systems. So if you think about um, with cybersecurity, the risk, if you think about fraud detection, with everything becoming digital, the risk that we face as, uh, as homo sapiens, as businesses, as communities, as governments, as organizations, as countries, um, there is huge risks in terms of uh, systems. And um, so we, we can use AI, and other smart technology in innovative ways to actually create solutions that can help protect us as well. So we've created this world, it's like a runaway train. Um, we've got to think carefully about how do we use smart technology to, to create still a safe world and in a world that we can thrive. Um, okay, so that slide, so let's, yeah, so I maybe just want to mention, just from a Cortex side, which is my AI business, AI engine for business, uh, one of my companies. Um, so the way we've looked at the world, and, and I'm just extracting this because I think it's very general and applicable to, to AI innovation in general. So when we look at AI solutions categories, I've, me I've mentioned the two, the world of the industrial world, but also the consumer facing world. So in the cons consumer facing world, that to be to having ultra personalized solutions is the name of the game to have AI enabled engagement that's going to be absolutely key so what we are doing we, we obviously have solutions in these solution categories but then also it's not just your normal types of data we also have audio video geospatial data data coming from IoT so that we can sense the world in a better way so there are very specific solutions sense solutions that you can also plug in and, and there's a lot of innovation that's happening with these additional data sources that's coming to the fore. And then I've had this enhanced bracket, which is more about real-time causal analysis or um, anomaly detection or fraud detection or security-based solutions. So this kind of covers a huge space, but with these type of solutions, you can solve quite a bit of problems and you can actually innovate in a, in a substantial way. So, I think that, so that is a nice summary for that. 
Uh, the year I'm just summarizing it again. So helping people and businesses work smart at scale, that's engaged. Smart personalization of customer products and services, that's the personalization. Um, smart automation enhancement of business processes and systems. And then sense is enabling smart machine to sense and interpret the world around us. Uh, so those are all just those solution categories. Okay, so I'll skip some of this. This is just talking about the AI engine and the things that you need for that. I just want to quickly reference when we talk about innovation and I'll soon pause so that we can take some questions as well. I, I do have a, sec, a, a second section where we're, where we're talking about um, innovation from a different perspective, but I just wanted to make it more practical. So these examples that I'm displaying on this particular slide is just very some recent ones that we've been involved in um, across consumer facing businesses, as well as um, the industrial world. So just to give you an example of some of the innovations that's happening. So in one instance, we, are, we have a retail customer with 8 million loyalty scheme members. And what we started to do is to, to implement Amazon uh, type smart personalized recommendation for these retail customers. So they can have that kind of uh, level of, of recommendation. So that was one thing. Another one that's huge in the financial services sector is to do dynamic price optimization and prediction. In this case, it was for home loans. And if you increase the, if you just, if it's just a few a percentage increases of, uh, of, of say the home loans market, that, that translates to, in our case, billions of rands. So if you get that right, so it's a high value problem. And that's what I like about AI and applications in the smart technology era is that you can have a major impact on a business by having the data properly mined and implementing innovative solutions so you can do these kind of things. Um, another thing that we are doing, and we are, we've got a huge focus on this, um, and we've already seen a lot of chatbots and so forth, but I think we're, we're, in, we're entering this decade also a new decade where we're taking chatbots or intelligent virtual assistants to the next level. And the way you do that is by having ultra personalization and obviously accessing multiple data sources and also having more state of the art AI to understand intent and meaning. Um, and that's exactly what we implement. And, and what we've done is we've built a, a, a really incredible solution around wellness, uh, personalized wellness. Um, and um, so that, that is uh, a, a very nice example as well. Then there's other things like churn prediction. We're talking about significant cost savings. Um, the other one is if you think about just utilizing um, personalization um, is intelligent customer communication automation, where you can have machine learning, reading emails, understanding the intent, um, reacting, routing emails, but also looking at attachments putting the emails and attachment into buckets um, and, and, and interpreting that at scale. So those are examples of things that we're also uh, doing. Fraud detection is another one. Um, and then there was also in the, in the medical um, healthcare space, um, just you can apply AI to do um, dynamic risk scoring for hospital benefit management. So we built models that actually predict the uh, length of stay in a hospital. And it's quite interesting to think about COVID-19. Obviously, you get various use cases and so forth. But in this particular, if you think about medical schemes, and this is a medical scheme administrator, it was important to understand length of stay and cost um, um, of those kind of things. And then what they want to do is, we do see a lot of fraud, waste, and abuse with this. So they want to make sure that they um, identify the exceptions. So this is about significant savings um, uh, through exception management. Um, so that's th that example. And then I've got one example here, and there's many, many, many. My, my previous AI company, Season Systems, we did quite a bit of world, uh, work in the minerals, metals, mining, industrial industry, the energy industry, but the, and manufacturing industries. Um, and in this particular case, it's about AI-driven automation of mining operations to increase the revenue and reduce risks. If you, again, instrument uh, a specific piece of equipment, um, there's, and, and you can make sure that you um, ensure uptime, but you also make sure that you optimize the predictive maintenance, the maintenance around this, 
um, there's there's a huge potential, and we've got some very interesting use cases there. But I'll I'll um, leave it at that. Um, I just want to quickly mention. So so one example I mentioned the intelligent virtual assistants um, in terms of um, wellness. So here's an example of intelligent virtual assistant that provides information and personalized advice and coaching and guidance with respect to healthy eating and diet, exercise and fitness, mental wellness and health and also chronic lifestyle diseases. And what we're doing is we've got a rich AI data-driven backend that's mining the data so that one can do intelligent and relevant personalized user interactions and nudging as well. So there's a bunch of knowledge bases that we have. Just to quickly show the thing here, the problem here is there's about eight risk and behaviors that's driving 15 of the, the, the chronic conditions that's accounting for 80% of the total cost for all chronic illnesses worldwide. Diabetes, um, coronary artery disease, hypertension, all of these um, as well. So instead of having a chemical solution where you use pills and all sorts of things, there is um, a better solution where you can be preventative around these kind of things. So we are building um, um, some state-of-the-art uh, solutions around these kind of things as well. And you can also then say, we're not only doing health wellness, we can also look at financial wellness, and you can also build holistic, dynamic, 360 degree profiles of health and financial wellness, um, and um, and do these kind of things. So, I want to mention that. So, I'll just uh, this is just showing examples of that. I'm just gonna I don't want to go too much detail there. I want to leave some time for discussion. Um, I'm gonna skip security. <clears throat> so, I just want to maybe the last part here before we can go open it up. So if you think about innovation and how you transform businesses, there are the five pillars that I think the Industrial Data Corporation, IDC, talks about also the five pillars. There's some other organizations that comes up with the same uh, concepts and frameworks. So the five elements of successful, innovative AI transformations is really intent, which is more about the strategy, data, technology, processes, and people. And if you think about intent strategy, you obviously need to understand, again, the business value drivers. What, what is the solutions that you want to implement? What is going to be your biggest bang for, for your money? What is going to provide the quick wins? So, so those are very important. You almost start there. Um, and then to, in order to implement these kind of solutions, you obviously need to look at your data ecosystem. You need to look at your technology, techniques, and tools. And any solution that you implement will affect process as well. So you need to think about how do you integrate that into your workflow? And then finally, people, absolutely key. We can't, uh, we, technology should serve us as people. So when we implement solutions, even if we automate certain tasks, we need to understand what's the impact. And we've got to have an open culture. And, 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 and we need to think about people and how their roles within a job change, uh, those type of things. So on the, on the right hand side, I have this, graphic that's showing accelerating the path to value generation. And again, I've got the five pillars here. And basically what we're saying is, how can you do this quicker? How can you accelerate this? How can you bring the curve back? So on the, on the X axis, we have time. And basically what we're trying to do is, is, if we want to bring it back, you need to think carefully about um, the five pillars. And you think about data availability, uh, distributed computing, analytic tools and platforms, data science skills availability, how do you organize your organization, process and change management. All of this is important things that you need to bring into to play. And what you can do, this is just drilling down to a bit more detail about these um, uh, catalysts to generate business value. Um, and it just shows a little bit more of the things that you need to do. And typically what we find when we deal with customers um, data is typically in silos and, and you need to, um, and they struggle to bring it all together. So you need to, to automate and to, to create AI-driven real-time machine learning type of solutions, AI-driven solutions, you need rapid access to all available data. So that's absolutely key. Um, but then again, you also need to identify fit for purpose AI tools. What we also recommend if they want to move quickly that you partner with AI companies that can help you accelerate um, and agile, being agile, test and learn, 
Uh, we are applying it for ourselves. We recommend that highly for, for companies as well. And then you need to integrate AI into the workplace processes. Um, you need to optimize human machine interface and all of those kind of things. And you also need to have an open collaborative culture. You need to build trust in AI's insights and systems. And you've got to reskill the workforce to ensure uh, complementarity. So these are all very important things to implement AI uh, in a responsible way. Um, so, so I think that's absolutely key. And then um, I, what I will also do, um, the Industrial Data Corporation has got this big data analytics maturity scape framework where you can actually look at a company and you can look at those five things that I've just mentioned, intent, technology, people, data, processes. And you can see how can we get to an optimized state for each of these five pillars. And you can measure this over time. You can't manage what you can't measure. So if you start instrumenting, you looking at where you are, are you in an ad hoc state? Are you in an opportunistic state, or repeatable state, managed state? You want to obviously be in an optimized state. So you want to drive all these five pillars to that. Um, so, so one can be very systematic in the way you operationalize and create these innovative AI solutions. So that slide co uh, covers that. Um, there's also a framework for identifying AI opportunities. Um, and maybe because we're talking about innovation, <laughs> Let me just very briefly talk about it. So you can always specify, if you look at the um, X axis here, we're talking about work complexity and the Y axis, we talk about data complexity. So if you think about work complexity, if you look at the left hand side, routine, predictable rules based, as opposed to ad hoc, unpredictable, judgment based. So work complexity, complexity can vary like that. On the y-axis we've got data complexity where you can see uh, below your structured stable low volume as opposed to unstructured volatile high volume and if you organize things like this you can say okay if we look at the left quadrant here we can do clearly automation because data are less complex it's structured stable and low volume and it's routine predictable rules based so you can implement say robotic process automation solutions you can um, machine learning AI solutions, and this fits into the efficiency model, where there's routine work of little discretion, high reliance on well-defined and well-understood criteria, and clearly you can implement solutions there. So that, that there's some AI opportunities right there. If you actually move up now, where data is unstructured, volatile, high volume, you would see you can support seamless integration collaboration. So there's wide range of interconnected work activities. There's a higher reliance on coordination and communication. And what you typically find here is your virtual agents for consumers or for enterprise customer services fits into this bucket. So the one below is more kind of automated credit decisions and so forth. This one is more the, uh, the virtual agents. Now, if we move to the right hand side, if we look at the, the expert model is where you still have structured, less complex data, it's, um, you can leverage specialized expertise. And solutions like expert systems for medical diagnosis or legal or financial research probably fits in here. But the work complexity is still complex, um, but the data complexity is, is not um, that high. And then finally, you can move to the innovation model where it's all about enabling creativity and ideation. And there's original innovative work. There's a high reliance on deep expertise, experimentation, exploration, creativity. So obviously, all sorts of research, design, like fashion design, music writing, all those kind of things probably fits into this category. And your AI is more augmenting as opposed to automating. So it just, it was just, it's just interesting to look at um, this kind of analysis. And, um, and I think about the future, just my last few slides, um, the journey from assisted to uh, autonomous intelligence, I think that we, we're gonna see a lot of this. And the autonomous market will probably be the biggest one eventually. Um, so this is, I think, originally from PwC, where they talk about uh, the size of the market, but the, I think assisted intelligence, augmented intelligence, and autonomous intelligence is, is a useful way of looking at the, also the different types of man-machine intelligence um, that one would get. And if you think about that, the assistant intelligence, you know, the nature of tasks don't change. Tasks are automated. Humans don't learn, machines learn. 
And examples are typically you've got uh, uh, processing factories, boilers, machine, machinery, ovens, all sorts of things like that. That's more kind of assisted intelligence. Then when you move to augmented intelligence, the nature of the task do change. Humans inform machines, machines inform humans, and, and could be things like business strategy analysis using machine learning or smart clinical decision support. And then when we move to autonomous intelligence, the nature of the task will also change. But here decisions are automated, machine learn continuously, and we see this with self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles, smart investment, we know with trading, you've got 24 seven type of trading solutions and implementation. So those are examples of what we can expect um, going forward. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly, uh, um, I maybe just wanna mention before I end with my final slides, I think what we will see in the future, um, there's, there's, there's probably uh, only a few occupations that's fully automatable, and obviously occupations will change over time. Um, and this was just a stat where they say 60% of all occupations have at least 30% technically automatable activities. So, so you can see this is indicated right here. So this is obviously looking at example occupations and they were just looking at um, obviously 62% here of occupations, at least 30% of activities are automatable. But you can see the things that's automatable. So there are occupations that are 100% automatable and there are occupations that's, that's, that's not automatable, um, at least with current technology. Um, so uh, just before my final slide, so I think also very important, one needs to think about AI and, and the risks involved. So potential harms from AI driven or algorithmic decision making is important to think about individual harms and also collective social harms. Um, so those are obviously important things to think about. Um, this is just a nice way of looking at that. Um, I just wanna, yeah, so maybe just wanna, uh, say something about this. So this is in the European Union. I think it was um, the AI expert group. They, they came up with this framework for trustworthy AI, which I thought was quite good. And they talk about um, lawful AI, ethical AI, robust AI. And very important that if you implement solutions that you adhere to the ethical principles. And the four ethical principles is respect for human autonomy, prevention of harm, fairness and expli uh, explicability. So you obviously need to explain decisions. And then the, to, to realize trustworthy AI, there are seven requirements. Human agency and oversight, technical robustness and safety, privacy and data governance, hugely important. And I know Europe is, 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 has got a leading role in terms of uh, GDPR and all these kind of things. But I also think transparency, diversity, non-discrimination and fairness societal, environmental well-being, and accountability. So if we implement trust, uh, AI solutions that adheres to these principles and these requirements, we're on the right track. So I think that's the message around this. And then um, my final slides just around this, I would recommend also a book by Dr. Kai-Fu Lee, AI Superpowers. And he had a TED talk, he was, he was talking about um, AI over the next five, 10, and 15 years. And basically what, what he looked at here was, um, if you think about any repetitive task, AI will in the next five years um, be impactful, super impactful um, and, and, and providing solutions there. Routine tasks within 10 years, optimizing tasks within 15 years, and probably when it gets to complex and creative tasks, we're probably safe for now. Um, now, if you think about the world like that, and you think about, uh, jobs and you think about the world that we want to create society that's why I talked about we need to think about society so you, you can look at jobs on this x-axis here and you can say okay, there's a bunch of jobs uh, under repetitive routine optimizing complex creative but and you can organize it from being optimized to more creative and strategy towards the right now if you uh, look at that and you say let's re-engineer jobs and society and economy, where we add another axis. We say we value humans and we, we're not gonna, um, we wanna be innovative around the, the way we look at economy and the way we look at jobs and tasks within jobs as well. 
So if you add a, a compassion axis, and this could be just one of many other dimensions that you can add as well. So one can re-engineer a multi-dimensional space. This is not just creating a two-dimensional space where we're just looking at jobs from that perspective. So if we say we've got a y-axis where compassion not needed and compassion needed. So if you look at this, you can actually say we can reposition those jobs across, well, across the space. And then you would find there are actually a bunch of jobs that's in the space of automation and where compassion not needed. And then when you move to the right hand side, you would see more the creative artistic side, um, but where maybe compassion not needed, like research analysts, economists, scientists, and so forth. But then you can also move up to the scale above the, the two quadrants above, where you can say there are jobs that where it's creative, strategic, and where you need compassion. And there's many jobs. This is just very few, just a sample of things. But then you can add more jobs. You can say, let's value teachers, social workers, all these, and, and, and pay appropriately, and, and start adding jobs where compassion is in fact needed. Even though they could be routine and it could be optimized to a certain extent, but you add the compassion layer, uh, for instance. And you can add more. Um, high school teachers, elderly companions, we know the, the people are getting older. Um, so basically what's happening here is we will see in the left quadrant here, you see AI automating a lot of the things where compassion not needed and we optimize. You then see on the right bottom, you would see AI and then human plus AI. The top left um, quadrant, you see the um, the um, AI being used by the warm embrace of humans. That's where you can see the compassion that comes into play. And then the place where compassion is needed, we see a lot of creativity and strategy is, is more where humans really play. Um, and you can have more fulfilling types of tasks and jobs. And obviously AI can also help with creativity and strategy and all of that, but that's still a space where humans can really occupy. So the, all the orange places is where humans can really occupy. Okay, so, so that was, um, I think that's probably it. So I wanna uh, uh, maybe just stop my screen here, my, end my show, and I wanna go back to uh, the presentation here, so my Zoom, here we go. Hugo, can you still hear me? Yeah, so we, we can hear you very well. Fantastic. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, just stop sharing my presentation for a moment so that I can see everyone. And uh, so hopefully, uh, so that was basically what I wanna quickly discuss, but I'm all ears. If you wanna ask questions, uh, please uh, let me know and uh, I'll happy to address that as well. First of all, thank you very much. I think this was a masterclass of artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence can improve, augment, enhance the world. Uh, and uh, Kevin Kelly, uh, one of the Wired Magazine co-founders said, and, and your presentation confirms that, the yeah. business plan for of the next 10,000 startups are easy to forecast. Take X and add AI. Yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and I think your presentation uh, proves that pre pretty well. I have one question because I'm curious about your business model. I could see a few uh, AI, let's say, or machine learning, deep learning, uh, neural networks, engines that you guys developed. Are you selling that as a service, as a product? What is your business model all about? How ready are those models, al algorithms? Yes. Um, yes. So, so this is the interesting world. So, so my, my previous AI company, um, CSIN Systems, we wrote everything from scratch. It was, uh, it was before... Open source, well, open source really took off in the mid 2000s, uh, maybe latter part of that. Um, so I appointed my students, we wrote all these, I've personally written, uh, hi. <laughs> I've personally, hey. <laughs> um, I've, 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 so we've been involved in that in creating product and solution AI engines. Now, in terms of what we're doing right now with Cortex Logic, so we create an AI engine for business, but it's slightly different because it's, it, we live in the API economy. API stands for Application Programming Interface, and it's, and it's plug and play components. You've got lots of different APIs. So we've got proprietary APIs that we write ourselves. There is open source APIs. If you think about the AI world, and you think about 
what Google um, what making available for TensorFlow, for instance, what Facebook is making available, PyTorch, and all these kind of tools and open source stuff that's available, that's the way of the future. So clearly things are moving towards software as a service, uh, cloud-based, platform-based solutions where you utilize APIs at the back end and you, so you can scale with these kind of solutions. So the way I'm looking at this is, yes, we've got proprietary stuff. We've got there's commercial APIs. We're interested in best of breed. There's open source. And you can start combining that in creating valuable solutions uh, for customers. Um, and typically, the stuff is embedded as a software as a service or platform as a service or kind of cloud-based as a service type of solutions. And obviously, you can implement on-premise, but you can also have it on, uh, in the cloud. So I think um, the, the age we live in now, 2020, it's about being masters of that smart technology toolbox that consists of all these building blocks and Lego blocks and the ability very quickly to innovate and put this to back at scale. So that's how we created our AI engine for business with all those solutions. But what we've done is um, we also live in the age of, um, we see this plat scalable platform businesses where you can be super disruptive. So we, we, we're not just interested in innovative, just AI specific solutions. We're interested in disrupting, not only disrupting, but creating better solutions, potentially for industries, um, um, creating better platform businesses, because we see a lot of examples. We see what Amazon is doing. We know Uber, Airbnb, all these businesses, but there's incredible opportunities to create domain specific platform businesses that solve problems. And, and, and typically, in our case, we want to be as impactful as we can. So it's super important to actually uh, make sure that you use all these building blocks, all these solutions, into solutions that's really making an uh, impact, but in a scalable way, and typically a platform-driven way. And that's what we are. We've actually evolved the business from just providing enterprise AI solutions to one that's really starting to zoom in and focus on platform, scalable platform businesses. So, and again, that's cloud-based. Um, you have solutions that's obviously on the mobile apps, Android, iOS. You've got progressive, we also implement um, uh, PWAs, progressive web applications, um, and, and, and all these kind of solutions. But everything is driven by cloud-based backends, um, where there's a lot of data mining happening in the backend. You can also have AI on the edge implemented to do some of the analysis and things on the phone or on a piece of equipment. So it's a whole combination of things. And, um, but yeah, so, so hopefully that answers your question. Excellent. If, uh, first of all, if you don't mind me asking you a couple of questions as well. My, most welcome. Before, before starting, congratulations, outstanding presentation. It's a very interesting topic. Uh, and I have two, two, two questions. The first one is, uh, as, we've, as you've uh, explained, creativity bound professions are the least, uh, or are not in the first wave of uh, AI replacement. But, but however, we do see a lot of experiments in that field. Uh, this week, just this week, The Guardian revealed an article written fully by a robot. And if he didn't present himself as a robot, you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice. And uh, and the article is um, quite funny, so they embedded some sense of humor into it. <laughs> yes. And uh, but also you see paintings and music uh, compositions made by AI. So that's uh, creativity is is still far reach, but it will reach it. Uh, it I, AI will arrive. So yes. that's the first. The second topic is uh, regarding the ethics. That uh, a thing that we also uh, approached. Uh, autonomous driving is an example. Autonomous driving is arriving, and the way a car will behave in in, in front of a of a human in a crosswalk, and the, the the brakes fail. Does it hurt the human in the crosswalk, or does it hurt the human uh, inside driving? So those sorts of questions are coming up. That's going to be the first uh, live example, uh, I, I would say, in the market. And I don't believe that governments and institutions are doing enough to monitor this or to legislate, to create legislation for this to be a reality in our world. So these are the only two questions, creativity and, and uh, lawmaking. Yes. Eloy, that's, that's fantastic. Yes. Um, that's your name, eh? Eloy. Yes, is it that, is, correct. Is it? No, uh, it's an excellent question. Um, and I think 
incredibly topical. Um, I, I think it's important to understand also where we are with AI right now. So AI, even if you look at G, G, uh, open AI, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, GPT-3, open AI, they obviously use that. If you talk about articles being written, that's, that's G, the, the state of the art is, is by GPT-3 uh, right now. But GPT-3 can do amazing stuff. So that, I mean, we're talking about neural networks being trained with 175 million parameters, um, huge, costly type of solutions, but they, it's incredibly powerful. They, they learn on the whole of Wikipedia. Um, they learn, well, I think Wikipedia is less than 1% of training set. So they've got so many books and so many information. The, the, the problem right there is, is that it doesn't really understand. It can generate stuff, and because it, it does get patterns and stuff, it can generate stuff, but it's, there's not true human-like understanding because they don't have a worldview, it's not anchored. So there's some more innovation that needs to happen, a lot more, to create true AI that will be, have a proper understanding that can compete with us from a human perspective. So you will get a lot of kind of smart stuff. Okay, that doesn't mean you can still generate practical things because as you rightly say, it could generate, well, paintings. We know they could, you can look at a Van Gogh painting and, and it can learn on that and then it can apply the patterns there and create something new uh, as well. So we've seen those kind of things. So I think there's a lot of experimentation happening and you are 100% right. We are clearly on a route where we will have AI impacting and infiltrating that area. But we got to be wise as humans how we use it as well. So we obviously need to think carefully. I think we're like kids in a candy store, uh, humans, and, we, and, it's, and it's so much so powerful technology. We, we need wisdom how to use these technologies in a proper way. So, so that's why when you talk about ethics and trustworthy AI, and we talk about, we need wisdom to, to not, to not use these technologies and create lethal autonomous weapons or create self-driving cars where there's not, no ethics building um, or trustworthiness and stuff. So it's actually quite urgent. So that we need to have governments thinking about regulation and so forth, for sure. But as citizens, we got to be super, uh, we got to make sure that we want this as well. We got to drive towards a world where we, we, we demand um, responsible use of these technologies. And obviously we, we see what we people are doing with nuclear power and, and we still grow, <laughs> we, we, we're still creating a super dangerous world uh, on multiple facets. So, um, so we feel safe. We haven't had really a lot of wars for decades and so forth, or major wars, but it, it, we saw with the pandemic how easily things can change um, and things can change very quickly if you've got humans that's just um, doing something uh, wrong as well. So we, we, it is dangerous time. So, um, so I think we need to step up in terms of how technology is being used so that it serves us. We don't need to do it the other way around. We don't need to do it. So that's why I'm writing this book on transformative human-centric artificial intelligence. And it's really focused on what is the future that we want and, and, um, and re-engineering and think carefully about that and then building solutions to get to that world. Uh, but we're going to need a lot of stakeholders. It's not just business that would solve it. It's going to be government. We, we need to work together as a society, um, as, as a homo sapiens, because the problems that we face is not just national. It is global. Uh, and even if we try to be nationalistic and we see that ten, a tendency right now, climate change, if you think about um, lethal autonomous weapons, nuclear, uh, there's many others. That's impact. It's across borders. We're already connected. We've created the nervous system for homo sapiens, effectively, right? So we're not going to get rid of that. Even if we try to silo things for a little while, <laughs> we are, we are. And so, so you touch on so important points there. And so there's urgency needed to, to look at both, both those areas. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, I see it's, it's almost top of the hour, but yeah, so we've got still time. But my, my question is more on a practical business level. Um, I mean, we, we know 
the advantage at uh, building AI or introducing AI in processes and auto, um, automation and uh, in a business. But how do you go about convincing kind of the older school businesses that they actually need to invest or uh, at least even think of making a shift to AI solution? Um, wh where do you kind of start getting them to think about how they can apply it in their domain or even if even showing them a possible solutions they still are embedded in, in old world technologies and, and kind of are very slow to to change i mean yeah. us innovators of course know all the the, the advantage but <laughs> yeah no eric you're 100 right so we, what we find I've, I've seen a little bit of a shift the last year or two or three i've been in this space solving providing business solutions, operationalizing AI for about more than two decades now. And it's, it's been interesting in the winter period, the 2000s, where it was what you just described, that was everywhere. <laughs> it was even in the industrial space, very old school systems that's a decade or two decades old. Then you need to instrument, you need to put the infrastructure in place. But, but I think what we've seen because of social media and you see what the tech giants are doing, I think we, we see disruption happening. So what I observe is that there's more kind of, it actually tri trickled up to the executive management level and we engage with them as well. So what I do is for instance, we recently, uh, it was last year, we, we, we for instance sat with the executive management of a company and then we brainstorm with them some of the top quick win impactful use cases. And then, then you decide, okay, let's just implement one and see the impact of that. And obviously you need the domain expertise, they, people that understand their business, but then you obviously come with your tech and technology exp expertise and understanding what data is available, how you can apply technology and what, and what, why, what, what, is, what you are actually able to do to implement that kind of solution in that scenario. So it's the match of business, the domain expertise and the technology smarts to bring it all together. And then when you prove it, just a quick proof point, and it could be a quick one within a month or two, then you get the ball rolling. So, so I think um, uh, for me, that's, that's been our recipe. It, it has been working, but I, I definitely identify with, with what you said. You, you still have that old school thinking. And, and as a matter of fact, I just want to say, even with consumer facing businesses and finance, retail, all these industries, they struggle with a lot of problems, even they've got AI teams and so forth, but you've got data in silos and even politics between divisions, especially if it's a bigger corporate. And they, 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 the potential to unlock value is incredible, but they don't do it because they're not collaborating, they're not working together, they don't, they don't have rapid access to all available data. So that's a starting point. So they're, they're actually their own biggest enemy as well. So anyway, yeah, so identify fully. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting because uh, I'm uh, right in the middle of that at the moment and tried this ah. with, the, with the humanitarian sector and it, oh. it, it's, it's very oh. challenging. <laughs> oh, good luck. <laughs> Let me know if you need help. <laughs> I will connect with you, definitely. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, Hi. guys. Jordan. Hi. Yes. Hi. So, uh, I'm calling. <laughs> my, my name is Jordan, I'm, I'm working in a telco company in Senegal. I'm innovation program manager. And one key part of my, of my job is to provide a, a real support our data team in creating a real connection between my data team and an and expert like you. So, so, um, so I want one question. In today's hyper competitive world, description is, is increasingly common. How to, to lead a data-driven digital transformation with, with AI? Yes, so, so you innovation, you in telecoms, and there's incredible opportunities in telecoms. Uh, if you think about call direct records, I just wanna say, so I've got um, one of the things before I started Cortex Logic, just between CSense G and Cortex Logic, I was involved in Jumo, and we work specifically with mobile network operators in Africa. Um, MTN, Safaricom, Airtel, Tigo, I'm sure you're one of them. Which one are you? But what mobile network operator are you? 
uh, and, and in Expresso, this is... Uh, well, okay, so you're working, so it's part okay. Yeah, yes. Okay, okay, okay you got it. Uh, okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay, sorry. Okay, so, so basically what we did, and just to quickly show, so we collaborate with mobile network operators to provide a mobile money marketplace where uh, you know about, obviously, if, uh, if you think about um, the unbanked, most, most people is not connected to banks and, and, and basically if you provide a, a mobile money ecosystem where you provide um, solutions through mobile phones or even feature phones um, where you provide solutions where you actually pump micro loans or insurance products into the solution and using the mobile network operators mobile wallets, there's incredible opportunity to use call direct records Power, this power data, I've got all these, um, the data you've got available there. And that's very rich data because that gives you a lot of information around various things, airtime, message, all sorts of different things. But you combine, combine that um, with your, what's the, the, the wallet behavior. So what we did was to actually, the way we've reduced the risk in providing uh, loan, micro loans, to these kind of consumers that could be an entrepreneur, it could be someone that's, it could be anyone, it could be just, I want uh, to buy food, I want to buy stock for my little, my business, informal business, um, I want to travel, go there, I've got a medical emergency, all of those kind of things. And what we did was to actually provide, say, a loan that they pay back within a week, but if they pay back, there's obviously behavior on the mobile wallet and we can then pick up all sorts of information and patterns from there. And then if they pay back, they qualify for a higher loan. And in that way, you use call direct records to look at the risk. You're looking at the mobile wallet behavior and together you can actually provide uh, a, a nice solution. And you can look at risk, affordability, all those kind of things. So, so that was just an example of where I've been personally involved to build a whole data intelligence organization around that type of data. Um, these incredible opportunities. Um, so you're welcome to reach out and be uh, to talk for sure. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your, for your rich insight. I will send you an invitation on LinkedIn and, and after we can, can we schedule a, a, a meeting with my team. For sure. Sounds good. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. All right. So one interesting chat on, on, on GPT-3 on, on, the, there is. On, on the group chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's, okay, guys, one last, one last question, because I think it's almost 8 p.m. in South Africa, if I'm not wrong. <laughs> yeah. No, it's more late. <laughs> That's good. No, it's fantastic, uh, Hugo. I really enjoyed it. Um, any, any more questions? Most welcome. And um, we can always have discussions afterwards. You're most welcome to reach out. Um, if you share the video, um, obviously on YouTube, we will also, uh, if there's further conversations, happy to have that. All, all right. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, this was a masterclass in, indeed. I've, I've learned so much to, today. And hopefully we'll see all of you uh, next week. We will have uh, another special guest where we will talk about innovation accounting because we need to measure if our innovation efforts are working or not. And sometimes yeah. people think that, uh, you know, bean bags in the innovation lab, that, that, that that's cool, blah, blah, blah. But if you don't know how to show value, your CEO will cut your innovation budget very easily. And the, the speaker will be Dan Thomas. Dan Thomas is probably one of the worldwide expert in innovation accounting. Uh, he wrote um, the corporate startup uh, book with Tendai Viki and Tendai Viki is going to be our guest in two weeks time. So be here next week. This is going to be really cool uh, as usual. Dr. Uh, Jacques Ludic, thank you very much. Enjoy your evening. I hope to see all of you next week. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. Thank you. Bye, Thanks. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. 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 Nice to meet you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.